Well, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for coming tonight. And um, I would like you all to join me in welcoming our guest, um, who I think you all know, uh, the wonderful Rutger Beckman. <laughs> uh, so, there is uh, so much to talk about. The first thing I, I want to uh, say is that Rutger's book, which actually I've just been talking to him about, I think is kind of a manual for a new generation. If you haven't read it, buy it, get Rooker to sign it at the end. It's absolutely essential reading. Well, there'll be a lot of books to sign. Yeah, no, no, no. It's <laughs> amazing. It's a must people. read. Yeah. Um, I think the easiest thing to do, Rooker, is to um, start off with a little bit of, by way of preamble, a clip of you um, <laughs> at a certain event. <laughs> <laughs> Alpine, a certain Alpine event. I think I know in, which clip you're in January, about. Uh, and uh, maybe we can see how that goes. Let's see if that, here we go. You jumped. Up. Sorry, it's the. This. Can we have the um, the Davos one first? This is my first time at Davos, and. Uh, and I find it quite a bewildering experience, to be honest. I mean, 1,500 private jets have flown in here to hear Sir David Attenborough speak about, you know, how we're wrecking the planet. And uh, I mean, I hear people talk in the language of participation and justice and equality and transparency. But then, I mean, almost no one raises the real issue of tax avoidance, right? And of the rich just not paying their fair share. I mean, it feels like I'm at a firefighters fighters conference and no one's allowed to speak about water. I mean, this is not rocket science. I mean, we can talk for a very long time about all these stupid philanthropy schemes. We can invite Bono once more, but come on, it's, we gotta be talking about taxes. Yikes. That's it, taxes, taxes, taxes. All the rest is bullshit, in, in my opinion. I actually came, because I do believe we have an issue here, but I have to say, honestly, this is a very one-sided panel. You know, frankly, what people really want, what really want is a dignity of a job. I'd like for the panel to talk about beyond taxes, which every one of you have talked about. The only thing you've talked about in this whole panel on inequality, what can we really do to solve and help solve inequality over time beyond taxes? Let me tell you something. We're talking about jobs, but the quality of those jobs with poultry workers in the richest country in the world, the United States. Dolores, one woman we work with there, told us that she and her co-workers have to wear diapers to work because they are not allowed toilet breaks. This is in the richest country in the world. So don't tell me about low levels of unemployment. You are counting the wrong things. You're not counting dignity of people. You're counting exploited people. I, I want to... Well then, uh, so Rutger, you're not the Messiah. You're a very naughty boy, aren't you? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> can you say a little bit about that moment which went viral? Um, was it in the true Oscar Wilde fashion, well-planned spontaneity? How, how do you thought it through? Well, it was a little bit planned. So I was invited to Davos to obviously talk about my book, mm. right? And, and mainly about universal basic income, which has become quite a popular idea in the past couple of years especially in tech circles, actually. It's people, yeah. A lot of people in Silicon Valley are enthusiastic about basic income as, as an idea to do something about the threat of automation, you know, robots taking our jobs. Um, so my plan was just to, well, basically promote the book. Um, but then... <laughs> okay, so uh, next question. <laughs> <laughs> and then I became more and more uncomfortable during the whole conference, yeah. actually. And I was in a, at a, co a couple of private panels um, you know, because a lot of panels there are not accessible for journalists. And I tried to sort of raise the elephant in the room, you know, taxes, tax avoidance. And the response every time was quite aggressive. They didn't really like me talking about that. So it was only the day before, uh, because I knew on the last day on Friday I was going to do this televised panel. And, and this so was your I, shot. This was your chance to, have to say yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I just went back to my hotel room and I, I prepared this speech. And... Uh, Actually, if you see the full video, you can hear the, the moderator asking me a question, something about poverty, something about basic income, blah, blah, blah. And I more, just ignored the question and just, <laughs> just, gave, my speech, yeah. just gave my speech. So having, having done that, uh, we move on to clip two, which mm -hmm. is uh, when Tucker Carlson, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> of Fox, uh, 
makes the foolish error of thinking that he can catch Rutger out. Let's see how it went. You jumped the bandwagon. You're all like, oh, I'm against a globalist elite, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's not very convincing, to be honest. Why don't you go f yourself, you tiny brain, and I hope this gets picked up. Because you're a moron. I tried to give you a hearing, but you were too annoying for me. Uh, you can't handle the criticism, can you? There we have Tucker Carlson versus Drucker. We gotta be talking about Texas. Oh, no, That's really, it. Texas, really Texas, really Texas. Really, Texas. Really, we've already been that. Okay, <laughs> now uh, let's let's <laughs> let's look at uh, Carlson Gate. Um, yeah. Now, you must have known going in that he has tried to shift his uh, position. Yeah. Uh, and to kind of colonize some of the things that have interested progressive thinkers. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the conversation and why it ended up with Tucker seriously losing it. Well, um, I was surprised by the invitation, to be honest. Uh, it was on Monday, actually the middle of the night. It was 2 a.m. in Holland, so six-hour time, time difference. It was 8 p.m. In, uh, in the U.S. And um, uh, just a Friday before that, I had, I had a short brainstorm with a couple of friends for it from the correspondent, the journalism platform that I work for. And we were just, you know, drinking beers and thinking about, wouldn't it be fun to call Tucker Carlson a millionaire funded by billionaires? So then over, <laughs> over the weekend, over the weekend, I was, I was moving places, so I had no time to think about the whole interview. And then on Monday, just two hours before it, I realized, okay, I've got to do this interview. And the cat picked me up. And, and here I was in a you know, in a, basically in a very quiet city in this studio with one producer. And I said, you know what, this is the first and probably only time I'll be on Fox News. Uh, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna throw a hand grenade in there. Let's see what happens. He insisted you'd never watched it, didn't he? I mean, he, he, yeah. he, he claimed that it, had, yeah. it was literally impossible that you could that, have watched it. That was, was weird, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a very yeah. strange moment. Um, so then I said to this producer, I said, can you possibly record it so that I can show my friends that I actually called Tucker Carlson <laughs> A millionaire funded by billionaires. You yes. know that's that was was really important to me at the time. He said, "No, I can't do that. I don't have the equipment for that." I said, "No worries. I'm just going to do the interview. Let's see what happens." Right. So then I did the interview, and I just thought the whole thing was hilarious. Yeah. You know, he was just shout shouting in my ear, uh, and I don't know. He just completely lost it. And then this producer came walking into into the studio, and he's like, "I recorded the whole thing." <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> And, and then we started drinking beer. Uh, <laughs> and, and that lasted for like an hour or I so. I think Tucker probably had a drink too afterwards, <laughs> yeah. if not before. And, and, and an hour later, I was back in the, in the cab to my home. And uh, that was the first time I watched the video. I was like, holy shit, this is, <laughs> this is something. Yeah. So, what, I mean, one thing that unites the Davos clip with the Tucker clip is that uh, they can't handle it. Mm -hmm. What is it about what you're saying that drives a certain kind of millionaire, mm -hmm. or billionaire, completely mad. Well, it's obviously the place where I'm saying it. Sure, the, you know, the, the things context. That, exactly, the, the things I was saying was support, were supported by the vast majority of American people, right? 75% uh, of Americans are in favor of higher taxes on the rich. You can find similar figures here in the UK, you know? Yeah. Most people want the rich to pay more in tax. And uh, yeah, it's just that normally at those kind of places, um, people just aren't there. And it's not a coincidence that Fox News decided not to air it, right? It's just that in this era of smartphones, yeah, sometimes And is it also work. because it's frankly something that in that context and, and, and lots of other contexts too, just saying it, we need to raise taxes has become almost, I mean, heretical to the point of unsayability. Yeah. Um, and you, you were genuinely uh, saying something that I think they were not expecting to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that is fascinating. Isn't it, it is. I think that 10 years ago, it would have been unimaginable totally for unimaginable. a historian to go viral with a speech about taxes, taxes, yes. taxes. So I think that just shows you that I'm part of a much wider movement yeah. uh, of, of many more people, and often young people, who have just shifted the whole, you know, the whole political debate. Yeah. And now suddenly we're discussing ideas that were dismissed as completely unrealistic not very long ago. The same is true for basic income, actually. Absolutely. Let, I mean, let's, let's meander through the book a bit um, and its arguments, because what, I think it's very important to emphasize that the book, A, is very readable, and also it's about, it's not just about economics and public policy, it's also about psychology and, and ideas and their power. Um, and one of its central contentions is that 
when the crash happened, there was a kind of moment of cognitive dissonance, which you, mm. which you talk about. Um, th there was no, people at least didn't think there was a readily available idea or set of ideas with mm. which to deal with it. Yeah, exactly. And, and to, to explain this point properly, maybe sh we should go back all the way to the 50s. Yeah. Because what always fascinates me about the rise of this thing we call neoliberalism yes. or the whole Reagan and Thatcher phenomenon is that it didn't start in the 70s or the 80s. It actually started in the 50s with people like the economist Milton Friedman or the Austrian philosopher Hayek. Friedrich von Hayek who came together in this place called uh, Mont Pelerin in Switzerland. And they founded this Mont Pelerin Society. And back then they said, we're the real radicals right now. You know, in the 50s everyone was basically a socialist, or at least a Keynesian. They believed in big government, but we had tax rates of like 80, 90% for the very rich. Unimaginable right now, but that worked pretty well in this golden age of capitalism. Um, so they said to themselves, we're the radicals, and what we need to do is start developing our, idea, our ideas, you know, building our institutions, our think tanks. And this will take years and years and years. But at some point, there will be a crisis in the current system, um, and then we can take over. And this is exactly what happened in the 70s with the stagflation and the oil crises, and then Reagan and Thatcher came on the scene. Um, but if you want to understand those politicians, you really got to go back all the way to the 50s. Now, what I think happened in 2008 is that we had another crash, obviously, where it was a great opportunity to, you know, to inject new ideas, basically in the bloodstream of, of thinking. Um, but they were, just weren't there. So the issue with many people on the so-called, how do you want to call it, the left or progressives, was that they knew very well what they were against, against a lot of things, right? Against austerity, against homophobia, against racism, against growth, against climate change, basically against everything, uh, but not what they were for. Like they, they, they had sort of discarded the whole idea that you need some kind of utopian vision of where you actually want to go next. Um, so that was a problem back then. But the exciting thing, actually, in that respect, the book is already a little bit outdated, maybe, because in the past couple of years, um, things have changed so much. If you look at a politician like AOC now in the United States, I mean, she's, she's the person I've always been dreaming about, <laughs> the kind of politician, right? Yes, I think. Um, yeah. So that's very exciting. Yeah. Uh, but why the lag? Because it is interesting that, you know, 08 was such a moment, mm -hmm. 08, 09, and it, but really what it produced was a, a bundle of responses. Yeah. Fiscal conservatism, quantitative easing, uh, a kind of re review of the role of the state, um, an argument about austerity, but it didn't produce an idealism. Mm -hmm. And I just want to press you a bit further on why that should be so, mm -hmm. because it's not as if there weren't intelligent, progressive politicians and thinkers around. What mm -hmm. was... I mean, as you said, they were against things, but what was, what was holding them back uh, psychologically from mm -hmm. articulating a vision of optimism? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it was just that the only thing that they could come up with was, um, yeah, about going back up ideas to I the I mean, were they, st were they the still... Because the, 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 the left or the, the progressive movement parties of the 90s had been mm -hmm. so obsessed by discipline and message discipline. Mm -hmm. I wonder whether they were still It held might be back a generational thing yes, as well, right? I think so. So I was born in 1988. Yeah. Right? It was one year before the fall of the Berlin Wall. My generation is not traumatized by the Cold War. Yeah. Uh, when they say, ooh, that's, that's Venezuela, that sounds like communism, yes. we say whatever, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it, it doesn't work anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the defining moments for us were things like 9-11, obviously, yes. and the financial crash. And we came of age in this era of inequality that was spiraling out of control. And it's, it's really now that you, that you especially see people rallying around issues like climate change, and that more and more people realize that actually, if you want to be a realist today, you need to be quite radical. It's just, if you, if you say, oh, I'm a moderate, I'm a centrist, and I just want to tinker a bit out around the edges, that is like the most irresponsible thing when you think about an issue like climate change. And yeah. we need this massive transformation of the economy and move to zero emissions in just a couple of decades. You know, we need to do things that we haven't done ever before in peacetime. Uh, and that's the realist position because the alternative is much worse. So I suppose the, the beating heart of the book is, is the, uh, there are many things in it, but 
the notion of universal basic income. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, for me, one of the most interesting aspects of that was your, your uh, exploration of the ancestry of this idea. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Because it's, it has some surprising advocates, doesn't sure. it? Sure, yeah. It's actually a quite old idea. It goes back like 200 years. But maybe the most interesting moment was at the end of the 60s, when almost everyone believed that some form of basic income was going to be implemented in the United States and in Canada. Um, and what happened back then is that there was actually this guy called Richard Nixon, of all people, uh, the conservative president. Well-known progressive. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he was like, you know what? Uh, if everyone loves this idea, sure, let me yeah. be the president that makes history. So he had a bill for a modest basic income that got through the House of uh, Representatives twice. Uh, and then it hit the Senate floor. And only there was actually killed by Democrats. Not because they didn't like the idea of completely eradicating poverty. They, they loved the idea. Uh, but they wanted a higher basic income. Yes. So they had this idea like, oh, we just wait for a little bit, and then we'll have a better basic income a couple of years later. Um, it's, it's an astonishing history. Uh, at the same time, what happened back then is that you had these huge experiments with basic income, you know, where they gave thousands of families a basic income and they had lots of research researchers studying the effects. Like the Winnipeg uh, example you gave. Yeah, that was one in Canada, yeah. but you yeah. also had four major basic income experiments in the US. Now, there was one experiment in Seattle where they, you know, they found a lot of positive results. Healthcare costs went down, crime went down, kids did much better in school, you know. It's really an investment that pays for itself. But then the problem was, was that they also discovered that the divorce rate went up by 50%. So, yeah, I guess there were a lot of women saying like, you know, I don't want to live with that prick anymore. Bye-bye, <laughs> uh, <by> Felicia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, that, that was problematic, and many conservative people said at that point, you know, we don't want basic income anymore. This is going to make women much too independent. Um, and... <laughs> And then, uh, only 10 years later, they actually found out that a statistical mistake had been made. Yes. So in reality, the divorce rate did not go up at all. Yeah, um, yeah it's sometimes these bizarre coincidences yes. that matter a lot in history. And that, that's, what, that's what fascinates me. There's a series of um, objections to UBI which are worth going through, because you've, you knock them down in the book, but I think they're worth sort of, some of them are worth mentioning tonight. Mm. Um, I mean, the classic argument is, giving a, ma a basic income, uh, money for free, mm -hmm. dissuades work. Mm -hmm. So let's deal with that one first. Well, the, the first thing I should say about this is that is an empirical statement, so let's see what the evidence says, yes. right? You can just do experiments, and there have been lots of experiments since the 70s where they have actually given people free money, sometimes quite a lot of it, and just to see what happens. And every single time they found that the work disincentive effects are very, very limited. Sometimes they're just not there, sometimes they're very small, and they're compensated by pe people doing other useful stuff, right? More volunteers work, caring for the kids, caring for the elderly. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, the more fundamental uh, thing that I could say here is that actually basic income helps us to completely rethink what work actually is. Because we have such a simplistic or, or old-fashioned definition of work, right? We say work is this thing you do for an employer and they pay you a wage and, and you pay taxes over that and, and that's it. Actually, there's a lot of paid work that is not very useful. Mm. And this is what you Cool bullshit jobs. Yeah, that's, that's uh, David Graeber, an American <laughs> anthropologist. It's, it's an academic term now. Yeah. So it's, it's, <laughs> uh, it's, not, it's, it's not my invention. It's not rude. Yeah. It's, uh, um, some people call it socially useless jobs. Yeah, I think um, bullshit jobs gets the... Okay, bullshit jobs. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple of months ago, there was uh, some research being published by two Dutch economists. And what they did is they looked at a huge data set where people from, within, I think, 30 countries were being asked this question. Do you think your job adds anything of value to society? You know, are you productive in any meaningful way? And it turns out that 25% of the workforce in rich countries says, hmm, not sure, maybe not, probably not. 25%. So just think about how radical, how bizarre that is. That's like five times the unemployment rate. And I'm not talking about teachers or nurses or, or care workers here. You know, I'm talking about... about bankers and corporate lawyers and, and accountants, people with 
great salaries who went to Oxford and Cambridge, and we spend a lot of money educating them. And they are, they're often very talented and smart as well. And then they go on and do these jobs that are completely useless. They do that for 20, 30 years, then they have their midlife crisis, and then they use all that money they extracted from the rest of the population to paint for the rest of their lives yes. or something like that. <laughs> That this is, is <laughs> this is getting dangerously like a scene from Fight Club. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, to bring it back to policy wonkery, um, <laughs> um, it, it, again, one of the objections is how how does this relate to the pre-existent and often invariably hugely complicated benefit system in, in, mm -hmm. in a society? I mean, you know, if you were to int introduce a basic income in Britain, how mm -hmm. would it? Would it replace the benefit system? Would it be supplementary to it? How would mm -hmm. it work? It's important to emphasize here that there are many versions of basic income yeah. out there. So there are some really bad or even horrible versions of basic income that are being advocated. So there are some, for example, American libertarians who say, let's just abolish the whole welfare state yeah. and just give people one small cash grant. Yeah. I'm not in favor of that. In, th in fact, I think that would be disastrous. Yes. Um, a basic income would really be a supplement to the great achievements of the 20th century, right? right? Universal health care, quality public education, and then a universal basic income or a guaranteed basic income. Uh, that's really the way I think about it. Now, how do you finance it? There are obviously a thousand ways to finance, uh, finance it, and I'd like to finance it in a way that it will reduce inequality. Uh, also important to emphasize here, there are ways that you could finance a basic income that it will actually increase inequality, right? So the devil is in the details here. Okay, well, which leads us to, I think, what lies at its core, which is an assumption about human nature. Because the, the, the traditional assumptions that underpin a lot of these debates is that, you know, if you give people money for free, they will just do nothing. Mm -hmm. It's a, a core argument of your book, this is not so. And it's not just an assertion, you back it up. Mm -hmm. I mean, t tell us about what the, your research has showed about how people behave mm -hmm. when you give them free money. Well, this is the fascinating thing I've, I've experienced so many times, is that you ask people, what would you do with a basic income? And most people say, you know, I've got dreams, I've got ambitions, mm -hmm. uh, don't worry about me, you know, I've got wonderful plans. And then you ask them, what will other people do with a basic income? <laughs> and they're like, oh, other, other people. Uh, well, they'll probably waste it and spend it on drugs or, <laughs> or alcohol. You know, that's human nature, you know, that's sort of how it works. Conjugate uh, the verb. I, I build, you do drugs. They, yeah. <laughs> exactly, he ends up exactly. in prison, yeah. yeah. I guess this is, actually, this is what my next book is about because it's such a deep and fundamental uh, uh, thing that we get wrong all the time is that we assume that most people are selfish. Mm. Well, in fact, no. <laughs> yeah. Most people want to cooperate with other people and want to contribute something to society. And that's what you find time and time again if you look at the evidence. The thing is, we're just basically being brainwashed by this product that we call the news. Yes. Right? And the news is all about exceptions, about things that go wrong, about crises, about terrorism. So if you watch a lot of the news, at the end of the day, you know exactly how the world does not work. And you have a completely misguided view of human nature. Now, even more radical, uh, and a, a part of the book I personally found attractive was the, uh, the arguments for open borders. Mm -hmm. But this is so spectacularly counterintuitive at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm right that the book first came out in Dutch in, in uh, 2014, is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Since then, um, there's been you know, a huge surge in right-wing populism, Trump's election, Brexit, building the notion of walls, identitarianism throughout mm -hmm. Europe, um, and nativism. So it's you know, fair to say, I think, that the argument in favor of open borders is, is not actually winning the day, yeah. which is not to say it's wrong. <laughs> yeah. And it's, what I really wanted to ask you is, starting from where we are, rather than from in a kind of intellectual laboratory, how do you get to the point where, I mean, you, you deal with a lot of the myths about immigration, but they are very entrenched. How do you build a, an intellectual and, uh, narrative based, rooted in empiricism, but also in ideas and, 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 and emotions that will bring people to realize that, as you say, that, that, that actually open borders are a massive generator mm -hmm. of wealth? Well, I really think we need the historical perspective here. So 
my view as a historian is that history is the most subversive of all the sciences. The main message of history is things can be different. Yeah. Right? There's nothing inevitable about the way we've structured our society and economy right now. So if you think about borders, for example, or the nation state, it's a fairly recent invention. You sure. know? It's really a product of the 19th century. And for example, passports, they hardly existed at the beginning of the 20th century. And the countries that issued them, like Russia and the Ottoman Empire, were considered you know, backwards countries. Um, so an interesting question always to ask as a historian is, how will people of the future look back on us? Because we can look back uh, on people in the Middle Ages, right? Yeah. And we, we look at you know, those witch hunts and, and all those barbarian things that were going on, and we're like, oh, these people were terrible. We're so civilized right now. But then the, the question is, of course, how will they, what are the barbarian things we are doing right now? You know? Let's say in the year 2200. What will they say about us? What's the most horrible thing we're doing right now? We just consider it common sense. Um, and borders might be one of those things. Because borders are responsible for the biggest you know, discrimination that's, that's going on. Uh, like 60% of your income is dependent on the fact where you, where you were born. It's, it's apartheid on a, on a global scale, basically. And most of the objections we have against immigration uh, they're all terrorists, they're all criminals, they don't work, they take our jobs, etc. I go over all of them yes. in their book. They, they destroy social cohesion. Many yeah. of them have actually also been adopted these days by the left. But if you look at the, at the actual evidence, there's not much there. There's really not, not much there. So to put it in its purest and ghastliest topicality, um, how would you, if you were confronted with a dismayed Brexit voter, mm -hmm. explain to them that open borders are a good thing? <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great question. So I would, I would use the language of patriotism. That's the first thing. This is often a problem with many people on the left and progressives, is that they only use the language of care and of injustice, yes. right? And there's a certain part of the population that is receptive to that kind of question. You say, oh, it's so horrible what, what's happening to these refugees, or it's so horrible what's happening to these uh, poor people. We should help them. But you don't win elections with that. Right? So you need other things. One thing you could do is to say, we're the best country on earth, yeah. right? And we can handle this. Like what Angela Merkel did in, in yeah. Germany. Like, we're shuffling us because we're, we're Germans, right? So the French couldn't shuffle this. They couldn't do it. Uh, <laughs> the, the British certainly couldn't do it. But we're Germans. We can handle this. Yeah. We're good at organizing stuff. That was a very patriotic statement. And uh, many people said that it would become our downfall. Well, last time I checked, she's still there. Yeah. So um, that's, that's one of the ways. Because it, it's, it seems to me that now it, it, it's become baked into political discourse. Mm -hmm. I mean, would you agree that, in a sense, in all, of all the things you, you recommend in the book, including the, you know, the shorter working week and so on, um, this, that is perhaps the one that is going to take, that's the biggest tanker to turn? Mm -hmm. on borders. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that a fair assessment? Oh, it's definitely by far the most utopian yes. idea of my book. I think basic income, we could easily do that right now. We've got yeah. the means, we've got the research. Um, it's, it's not economics that's holding us back. It's not technology that's holding us back. It's really ideology yes. and outdated, out, you know, out of, sort of out of fashion uh, definition of what work is. But with open borders, it's obviously different. But I, do, I am trying to change the conversation there. And I'm trying to use history in a way to open people's eyes and, and just to show that nothing, nothing about this is inevitable. And we could have a very different conversation about, around this. To return to the, the, the Davos uh, intervention, as it will one day be called, I'm sure, in a film starring a Hollywood star, um, <laughs> it, it, the, the, the whole question of taxes is, is fascinating because, mm -hmm. um, as, as we said at the start, I mean, it, it, for 20, 30 years, the assumption of the Laffer curve that, that reaches a point where you, you know, the more you, you raise taxes, the less revenue you get has been mm. absolutely sacrosanct. Mm. Um, first of all, do you, do you uh, take issue with the, the, the Laffer curve? And secondly, if, if you do, what sort of taxes do you envisage raising? Mm -hmm. Because there's a, again, there's an assumption in, in British politics at least, that, the, that, that although you could probably squeeze um, some more out of income tax from the, the wealthier, that it's high time we started to tax mm -hmm. wealth, um, yeah. particularly as we are an aging society and so on. Well, the standard argument 
of course, and this, this argument was always made by Thatcher, is that if you have higher taxes, mm -hmm. the rich will work less, they'll produce less wealth, and we'll yep. all be poorer in the end. I think that if you look at the latest evidence that we have from economics, it turns out that actually the opposite is true. There's a good case to be made that if you have higher taxes on the wealthy, uh, that you make certain things not profitable anymore. Because we have got a lot of very rich people right now who do earn a lot of money, but don't con really contribute anything, right? If you zoom in on their but business why models. Why do they earn a lot of money? Um, well, it's a bit like, uh, why did pirateers in the 17th century earn a lot of money, you know? Well, by taking <laughs> it from other people. <laughs> they were really, exactly. Yeah. But then what happens is that, let's assume we're in the 17th century, right? And I would say, let's abolish piracy. Piracy yeah. is not productive. Uh, these people are just <laughs> murdering people and, 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 and raping, raping people and just stealing pe other people's stuff. It's not productive. Mm. And then imagine that someone else would say, yeah, but then hundreds of pirates will lose their jobs. <laughs> that's horrible. But that's yes. basically the debate we're having right now. How when to, I, make, how to right? turn pirates into teachers and, yeah. and social workers. Yeah, let yeah. them do something useful. Let them do something useful. Well, yeah. indeed, yeah. Um, Teachers of the Caribbean would be a very good thing. <laughs> uh, so, um, but again, I mean, we, we come back to a, 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 an analysis about human nature because you say in the book, I'm quoting, higher taxes would get more people to do work that's useful. Mm -hmm. Now that's a huge statement. Yeah, but um, you actually see it in the, in the there's, there's good evidence from the US here is that uh, Economists argue that the tax cuts in the Reagan era uh, made it more attractive for Ivy League graduates, you know, the, the most talented, the most smartest people, uh, to go to either Silicon Valley or to Wall Street. And they, uh, before that, they went to, like, say, universities or, or other government organizations or research organizations thinking about, uh, you know, how to get to Mars or something like that. I actually spoke a couple of months ago. I spoke with uh, Kasparov, you know, the, the great chess player who was beaten by this computer, Deep Blue, Deep Blue at, the, yeah. at the end of the 90s. And he was just, he was explaining that when he grew up, like smart people his age were really all dreaming, you know, they wanted to become astronauts. Yeah. But then something shifted in the 80s and the 90s and people wanted to become bankers. Or, and, and after that, they, they wanted to go to Silicon Valley until they realized as one former employee of Facebook, uh, Put it, is that the best minds of my generation are thinking about how to make people click ads. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of the most depressing things of today, is that there are so many smart people in the great capitals of this world, you know, in New York, in London, in Los Angeles, so many smart people utterly wasting their talents on stupid nonsense, basically. The, the obvious uh, uh, collision, I suppose, is if you have higher tax regimes and open borders, will you have people fleeing to low tax mm -hmm. regimes to carry on doing useless jobs? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> here the question is obviously how, how all of these ideas would work together, yeah. right? Um, I think that the, the purpose of utopian thinking is not to sketch some kind of blueprint. It's not what I'm trying to do in this book. Like, here's this perfect world where you have open borders, a guaranteed-based income, and I thought everything through. Sure. Obviously not. The purpose of utopias is, or, or utopian thinking is to ask the right questions, right? and to make us envision a society that might be radically better. But then, just experiment along the way. Just small, one small step after one small step. So I'm obviously not arguing we should abolish all borders overnight. But just thinking about borders in that way, you know, are they not one of the most unjust things we have right now? Uh, yeah. Just helps open up conversation, I think, and helps open up your mind. Which I think leads to a very interesting kind of governing theme in the book, which is that one of the big questions that emerged from 2016 was why was it that uh, the Brexiteers and Trump were able to mobilize an emotional narrative mm -hmm. uh, and the Remainers and Hillary Clinton's campaign were so conspicuously not able to. Mm -hmm. And I think that progressives have wrestled, particularly progressives who are very, very wedded to evidence-based, very dry approaches. And you, you say quite openly in the book that you know, they're, they're, a lot of what they say is dull. Mm -hmm. uh, and also that they play underdog too often, which mm -hmm. is a slightly different point. So here we are in 2019, um, and you've already alluded to what's going on in America. What, what's, what's the future narrative? Taking your kind of utopian 
charge? Mm -hmm. you know, what, what should be the next steps in this? Well, it seems to me that the issue with Hillary Clinton was that it almost seemed like her slogan was, no, we can't. <laughs> right? That's not going to happen. Yeah. That's too expensive. <laughs> I looked at it. Believe me, it's not going to work. Yeah. <laughs> you, you don't really win elections with that, yeah. right? One, one other frustrating thing was that just after the elections, uh, she did an interview where she said that actually uh, her campaign had considered uh, an idea called Alaska for America. Turns out that Alaska has this basic income already since the early 70s. It was instituted by a Republican governor called Jay Hammond. And uh, his idea was, you know, we've got all this oil in the ground here. That's everyone's property. So we're just uh, going to sell that oil, and then everyone received a, received a dividend each year, which is around $2,000 per individual. Adds up to, you know, can add up to $8,000 for a family of four. Mm -hmm. It's quite substantial. It's one of the reasons why Alaska has the, the lowest inequality in all of the states in, in America. So Hillary Clinton's idea was, or her campaign's idea was, this is the perfect marriage between conservative and progressive thinking, right? Alaska for America. I thought it was wonderful. Yeah. But then she, yeah, she told that three months after she lost the, the yeah. election. So slight, you can imagine yeah. that was quite a frustrating <laughs> moment for <laughs> not me. A, not great synchronization. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting. I, I, if you look at the uh, Trump State of the Union speech, um, there were two things that were striking. One was that there was this sort of extraordinary presence of white clad newly elected female representatives, AOC being the most obvious, mm -hmm. uh, very joyous moment. But also that Trump said uh, America will never be socialist, which suggests to me that he thinks that this is now a serious issue. Yeah. Did you, I mean, what's your interpretation of the American landscape mm -hmm. post midterms? Well, I think it's a really interesting thing that what a politician like Donald Trump and a, and a politician like AOC have in common, and I know this phrase is weird, have in common in this case, but mm. they, they do have something in common. They talk about winning. So Donald Trump talks, talks about winning all the time, right? We're going to win, win, win. America has been losing mm. for a long time. We're going to win again. Uh, AOC t talks about that as well. She says, this, um, this country is capable of such great things. We can do so many more amazing things, right? We can actually do this. Uh, uh, a green neo deal. We can do this massive transformation of the economy if we bring all, you know, uh, everyone together around it. Um, and I think that's exactly what people were yearning for in 2016 and what they will be yearning for in 2020. Uh, and I think exactly the same is true in the UK. This is one of the frustrating things around Brexit, right? So around Brexit, I have two views. The first view, as you know, someone from Holland is get on with it already, right? <laughs> uh, at some point, you just got to go, yeah. right? Uh, uh, because then we can finally make this union into a success. And um, Britain has been a pain in the ass, right, for, for uh, decades. Uh, I think that is the technical, so again, to use that's the, techni why, the technical term. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, but then the other thing is that if Brexit is happening anyway, then progressives or the left, they need to come up with their, their utopian version of Brexit. Mm. How can you actually make this into a positive thing? Because if you do not come up with some, something yourself, then this, they will come up with something else. And in this country, you have this whole network of think tanks. I was, you know, I was quite astonished to find this out, you know, like with, with fancy names like the, the Adam Smith Institute or the uh, Institute, Institute of Econo Economic Affairs. Yeah, yeah, I had a bit of a row with him on the radio this week. Anyway. Um, this is when things got frisky on the Jeremy Vine exactly, show. And they, it? they have got a plan for Brexit, yes. right? They want to make this country into a paradise for billionaires. Yes. That's what, what they want to do. That's not inevitable. Brexit doesn't have to mean that, but then you've got to get your shit together and come up with an alternative. Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Conceded. <laughs> but uh, if you are coming from the progressive side of politics, not necessarily mm -hmm. Labour, but just the general progressive uh, side, um, what, would, what would that look like? Because clearly, one thing it wouldn't include is open borders. Mm -hmm. So consistent with some of the things that you're interested in, how would you build a kind of post-Brexit ideal? Just, mm -hmm. just in terms of broad brushstrokes rather than the detail, what would be your kind yeah. of, what would be the Bregmanian vision? Well, it would all revolve around climate change. I think really? everything has to revolve around that. And I think that more and more people of my generation actually realize that right now, is that we've, I mean, you're how old? 
Oh, God. It's <laughs> so old. 50, if, 51. I mean, yeah. you know, it's terrible. But, yeah, I mean, your gen generation basically has done nothing, right? Yep. And, and <laughs> yes. What can I say? And, uh, uh, and we can't afford that. Yeah. Uh, we but really that, that, can't afford see, that. We, we, so, we, 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 uh, I mean, that is a really interesting observation because one of the, I said at the beginning that I felt this was, a, as amongst many other things, a generational track. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you've, you've talked to, you must have talked to thousands of people about this book now, thousands upon thousands. Do you get a sense of generational change? Well, sometimes I, 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 there, you can be young and still quite old, right, in your oh, mind? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, yeah. and, and vice versa. Um, but absolutely, and especially in the last five years. When I first published this book, um, yeah, many of these things, like basic income, I really had to explain that to people. I haven't even given a definition of basic income. Are there people who have no idea what it is? Please raise your hand, because then I'll still give it. But, you know, I just assume that people already know. Yeah. That wouldn't have been the case five years ago. I would have to explain it every single time I gave. The first lectures I gave about the ideas in this book were for, you know, small groups of, of long-haired anarchists, you know, a bit smelly, and uh, that was my audience <laughs> back then. <laughs> Uh, because that's basically how change works. Yeah. It always starts on the fringes with people who are first dismissed as unreasonable, unrealistic, crazy, radical, and then it starts moving towards the center. And that's what I'm interested and in. And what has driven that, do you think? I mean, what, what, across that period of four or five years, what are the main governing forces that have driven that change? Well, partly it's just hard work. It's activism. It's, uh, yeah. so. People were quite dismissive, for example, of the Occupy Wall Street. Many people still believe, oh, that wasn't effective at all. Well, actually, Occupy Wall Street got us Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Bernie Sanders got us people like AOC, et cetera. Yeah. It, it, it all needs each other, right? It all builds on each other. Um, so this is, this is the issue I sometimes have with these. Uh, there have been quite a few books recently about how the world is better than ever, right? Yes. And it's true, right? I start my book with that as well. Is that We've seen extraordinary declines of poverty, and, and people are much healthier today. We are, we are basically richer, wealthier, healthier than ever. You know? We've seen tremendous progress in the past two years. But then many of these books, like Stephen Pinker's books, for example, um, sort of, it feels as if they make the pain, stop, complain, point, stop complaining, oh, yeah. Yeah. everything is awesome. And they have this very sanitized view of history, yes. right? Where just some guy, in the 70th century had some great idea, like, let's all be rational. And then 300 years later, everyone was healthy. Yes. Sort of that. Yeah. History doesn't work like that. You know, yes. people actually fought for those changes. And all those people who, for example, who first argued uh, for the abolition of slavery or for democracy or for equal rights for men and women, they paid a high price for that. You know, they were uh, persecuted and, and, and ridiculed and dismissed, etc. Um, and I think that's often ironic with these, these writers, is that now they talk about, oh, these social justice warriors, and they're yeah, not sure. grateful for how wonderful everything is. Well, actually, those social justice warriors were, were the ones making all this progress possible in the past two, three hundred years. Because the interesting thing, I think, and this will be my last question, is, is the robustness of the idea of equality, which is that I think, again, to go back to the end of the 20th century, there was an idea that there'd been a great battle between liberty and uh, command and control egalitarianism and liberty had won mm -hmm. and of course it would be social amelioration and uh, welfare state and so on mm -hmm. exactly um, and uh, <laughs> but that but the the great drive for, for equality, equality was now going to be so, a subordinate uh, issue mm -hmm. and that doesn't seem to be so anymore I think in 2019 if you take the temperature of where politics is going it isn't necessarily in a libertarian direction mm -hmm. Very true. So, yeah. uh, but, but what, again, why? Is it, is it just because people see uh, food banks and um, uh, people rough sleeping in parts of London mm -hmm. where it costs a million pounds to buy a basement flat? I mean, why, why is that? I think that people do not necessarily want to live in an equal society. They want to live in a fair society. Oh. That, is, that is at least what psychologists now think based on yes. lots, lots of, of new evidence coming in. So... If you have a meritocracy where, you know, that people really believe in, where the people at the top also contribute the most and pay the most in taxes, et cetera, et cetera, people, you know, can get along with that. Why are they now so angry? Because they realize that actually those people at the top aren't contributing anything, yeah. they're not paying their taxes, and they do not deserve all this wealth. Yeah. 
That's the thing. People, people can believe in meritocracy if it's a fair meritocracy. Yes. Um, so that's what I'm really trying to do in this book, is that uh, we often say that you know, uh, the, the stronger sh shoulders should carry the, the, you know, the, most, the heaviest weights. And actually, the, re the really stronger shoulders that carry us all are the teachers, are the garbage collectors, are the nurses, because if they would go on strike, that'd be a disaster. Maybe, maybe to you know, one final story that I have in the book about this, is um, there were two strikes of, of, of different professions in the 60s. You know, one was of garbage collectors, strike losses for uh, six days, total emergency had to be declared in New York, yeah. yeah. Total emergency, turns out we can't deal without garbage collectors. Um, the other strike was of bankers two years later in Ireland. Um, and the bankers, they were angry that their wages were not keeping up with inflation. Uh, and they said, you know what, you'll have it, we'll go on strike. And all the experts predicted disaster. This was supposed to be like a heart attack for the economy. Strike started, nothing much happened. You know? it's like, and lost and, and lost it for six months. And yeah. pubs turned out to be very important. Yeah, this right? is the hilarious part, is that actually, uh, so the strike lasted for six months, the economy just kept growing. After six months, the bankers came back and said, all right, all right, all right, we'll get back to work. So, and what the Irish did is, it's really interesting. What they did is they sort of built their own money system. So they started writing checks to each other, IOUs, on, 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 on the backs of cigar boxes and on toilet paper. And uh, there were 15,000 pubs back then in Ireland. And sort of the pub owners became the new bankers. Um, there's one historian who later wrote that if you sell liquids to other people, you probably also know something about the liquidity of your clients. <laughs> so these pub owners were the perfect new bankers, and the system worked quite well, actually. Oh, okay. And uh, yeah, businesses just, just kept operating. Nowadays, if you ask people who lived through that period, you'll find out that many people just won't remember yeah. uh, because it didn't make much of an impact. Fascinating. Right, now, let's have some questions. Um, we've got microphones, and I want to take them in groups of three. So um, question here at the front. Do we have a... Roving mic. So let's take them in groups of three. Um, yeah, thanks for, very much for a brilliant talk. Um, but I, I think, I love your ideas, but I think change can happen better virally um, from the grassroots rather than through top-down governance uh, super states. And I think that's the direction of the future with the blockchain and the internet. I think that shows that we have a lot of potential for a, a networked style of governance and finance. I think we can have financial systems based on shared interests rather than physical location. And I think we can have governance based on shared ideology rather than physical location. And um, along the line of what you said to lefties, yes, you know, let's get on with it. We have opportunities here with Brexit. So. There's one over here, yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, without wanting to sort of ask you to lay out a blueprint, um, you, uh, you sort of noticed the growing movement for UBI within sort of libertarians and also within tech workers, especially around Silicon Valley, um, having noticed uh, sort of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Um, what, what sort of steps do you see to avoid UBI becoming just another means of transferring wealth to the richest from, from the state. Okay, um, and just one there. I can see just in the corner there. Okay. Utuspark was heel into a I wanted to ask about um, climate tax, uh, well, carbon tax, considering the um, response that uh, the yellow vests had in France and one of their possible uh, causes was a carbon tax. And I think it's, if you're talking about taxes, how viable would a carbon tax be? And, and why did the yellow vests have that response to it? That's great. a great question. So uh, to recap, um, the grassroots nature, mm -hmm. good question about UBI and carbon tax. Well, let me start with the carbon tax, because it's interesting. Actually, when I was at Davos, uh, I was in one private panel, uh, you know, talking about the rise of populism, etc. And uh, there was one French CEO who stood up and said, what people don't get is that if you really want to understand the Yellow Vest movement, 
you have to understand that Macron abolished the wealth tax in, in France. And they, people never really forgave him for that. And then after that, you had this fuel tax. And it was like, but who's paying for this transition, right? Sure, we're all in favor of, of a more sustainable economy, but who's actually paying for this? One of the most promising idea out there, ideas out there that actually has bipartisan support is the idea of um, implementing a carbon tax and then uh, using or just giving back that money directly to the population, right, in the form of a dividend. Uh, it's a bit similar to, to what they have in Alaska, obviously, with this oil money, but then you would use a carbon tax for that. Um, there are a lot of people from both the left and the right in favor of something like that. I think that's really important when you talk about this huge transition that we need to have. People got to have the feeling that everyone's contributing, right? Um, the question about um, how do we make sure that you know, we aim for a version of basic income um, that, is, that would actually Im improve life for the vast majority of people. Well, here my answer is very simple. Um, make sure that you take the idea for yourself. You know, I, I've, I've, I've read quite a lot of pieces like, uh, of authors who say, oh, basic income is a horrible story. It's a neoliberal Trojan, ho Trojan horse. Look, I heard Mark Zuckerberg say that he's in favor of basic income and Elon Musk is as well, so it must be a horrible idea. I don't know, that's, uh, that's such lazy thinking, isn't it? Uh, as I said, there are horrible versions and bad versions of basic income out there uh, that only puts more pressure on us to, to properly define what we're talking about and come up with the, the versions that do make a difference for the vast majority of people. Um, and then final question about grassroots. Um, actually, I think that's, that's what we've seen happening in the past couple of years, right? So, uh, I mean, you're, uh, not a, you're not a centralist, are you, really? I mean, the book is not a kind of plea for the massive no, goss no, plan. No, but what I do think is that at some point you've got to break out of your bubble, right? So it's not enough just to, uh, to talk to. I actually got a lot of pushback initially from people who said, oh, Rutger's going to Davos, you know, he's, he's going to have uh, drinking champagne with the, yeah. with the billionaires, uh, you know, he's been bought by the billionaire class. Quite a few angry emails about that. Right. Same with Fox News. Oh, he went on Fox News. But that's the thing. I think you, uh, at some point, you need to uh, break out of your bubble and try to build something that is, that is bigger. Great. Let's have some more questions. Um, yes, lady at the front here. Can we uh, bring in a microphone for her? Just coming. All right, thank you so much. And, and questions at the back as well, I thank can you. see. Right at the back there is afterwards, please. Yes, please, go ahead. When you talk about taxes and open borders, isn't part of the problem that the world is now so global that it's not just individual rich people that aren't paying taxes, it's these global companies who use the facilities, like in this country, say, Amazon and all these people, they use all our facilities and don't put back into it. So I'm not sure that it's just about taxing individuals. It seems to me it's more about taxing companies, and we don't seem to have got the sense of that, certainly in this country at the moment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, right at the back. Hey. So you gave the example of Richard Nixon and how his kind of surprise and support for universal basic income. Right at the back. Uh, me. Okay. Hello. Yeah, I yeah. see you. Hey. <laughs> and what I'm interested in that is I do find where these changes happen, they often come from people who have ulterior motives that lead them to do something that in fact is quite good. Uh -huh. And part of that is a lot of the decision makers tend to be in positions of uh, power, naturally. And so I'm interested, what are the like, separate motivators that you think would lead people that don't really have anything to gain from these ideas mm -hmm. to change to support these ideas that, you know, what would make them see the value in the idea of universal basic income if you're a millionaire or a billionaire? Okay, one, and let's have one more. Anyone over here? Yeah. There you go, thanks. Cheers. Hi there. Um, Rick, thanks uh, for the speech and great book. Um, I wanted to ask you your thoughts on a recent exchange between AOC and Bill Gates. Um, so AOC, obviously, you know, become very popular for a range of reasons. One of the reasons, uh, her raises to tax. 
Um, and Bill Gates, you know, points out that sure, you know, taxing, raising taxes will create some increases in uh, revenue for the government. However, the real way to attack it would be to make more taxes on wealth and on gains. So obviously, a lot of rich people, you know, they can uh, find very clever ways to make their income at a low bracket. But the real uh, income that they're getting is either because their money's in stocks which will come up as zero a lot of the time when it comes to income, or it will be in uh, corporate taxes, which obviously taxed a lot less. So I suppose my question is, it seems like with politicians generally, there's a lot of hyperbole. You've got people on one side like Donald Trump, you know, a lot of hyperbole. But then I think you've also equally got people on the left side who will say stuff like, we need to tax them super high, where it's hyperbole and not necessarily the most effective means I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Sorry for the long question. Hmm. No problem. Thank you. So hyperbole, AOC versus Gates. Very interesting question about harnessing ulterior motives and a question here about um, corporations and yeah. open borders and tax. Well, let me again start with, uh, with the last question. Um, there's this really interesting arms race going on right now, it seems, in the, in the Democratic Party. Like, who, who, which candidate can have the most radical proposal? Like, Bernie Sanders, I, I want an estate tax. No, Elizabeth Warren, no, wealth tax. And then AOC, no, I want a top marginal tax rate of 70%. And you know what? I love all of those taxes. I think, <laughs> I think we should have all of them, right? Um, when we talk about a top marginal tax rate, it's important to remember that uh, a very high top marginal tax rate on income Right, of around 70% is not meant to take in a lot of revenue. Because let's, I mean, in, in the UK, it was at some point it was like 80 or 90%, yeah. but almost no one actually paid that tax. Why not? Because it just becomes pointless to give someone such a high salary, right? Uh, if you have to give everything away immediately in tax. So the purpose of a very high top marginal tax rate is to have a maximum salary in your country. And I think that's a quite a sensible thing. Um, I think that Bill Gates is actually right that a more pressing issue now is to talk about wealth inequality, which indeed is, is, is a lot bigger in many countries. Um, and the exciting thing is that uh, Elizabeth Warren has come up with a plan uh, that was actually uh, made by uh, Emmanuel Saez and Gabriel Zucman, uh, two uh, colleagues of Thomas Piketty, you know, the, the French economist, who's, you probably all owned a book but didn't read it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I hope I won't be that kind of, uh, well, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, but they, they come up with a, with a very good plan, and that will ta bring in a lot more revenue. Um, and then obviously, yeah, inheritance tax has also seemed like a pretty good idea. My, my favorite version would, would be an, an inheritance tax where you can just like inherit, say, a thousand pounds over your lifetime, tax-free, uh, and um, if you have like seven or eight small inheritances, you know, that can be like 10,000 a piece or something, um, you don't pay any taxes over that. But then once you get above that threshold, you start paying tax over it. What the great thing about a system like that, well, what, what it would mean is that people would have an incentive when they die to spread their wealth, right? They'll not only give it to their, um, to their lazy son or something like that, um, that's what we really should call it. We should call an inheritance tax a tax on laziness. Uh, and then uh, they would also give it to, you know, to, to another friend and that person they met that was so nice, etc. So you have an incentive to, to spread it around. I love all of these taxes, to be honest. Um, and also the interesting question about um, how you can harness ulterior motives to social, socially desirable ends. Yeah, yeah. So there's one book that I really, really love and... and, and would recommend to anyone. It's a, it's a book by Rebecca Solnit. It's called Hope in the Dark. Mm. And she wrote it during uh, the Bush years, actually, yes. when the country had just started a war with Iraq. And there's one line in the book that I'll never forget. It's, uh, maybe I don't get, get it exactly right, but at some point she says, there's a certain kind of activism that cares more about being right than about actually achieving results. And throughout my you know, very short career so far, I've always tried not to be that kind of activist, you know? I really care about also achieving results uh, and not, not, not just only staying in my bubble. My bubble. So that, that means that you have to reach out 
and sometimes use a different kind of language, uh, use different kind of arguments. Uh, this is what psychologists call re moral reframing. So if we talk about poverty, for example, a lot of people in this audience will probably buy the argument that we should do something about poverty because it's just immoral, right? People deserve a, a certain min minimum of, of money uh, in their lives. Um, but then you could also make a very different argument. You could say, well, actually, if you don't have a heart, you still have a wallet, right? And there's a lot of evidence that shows that if you eradicate poverty, you actually spend a lot less on healthcare, on policing services, on judicial service. You'll save money in the long run. It's good for you, for, you know, even if you're, if you're very rich. So that's what I'm interested in, 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 in defending these sort of progressive ideas in, in many different ways. And then the last question, you're absolutely right, yeah. We should, you should definitely also talk about uh, this massive tax avoidance that going, that's going on by, by corporations. Um, in that case, in, in that you know, sense, you might want to reconsider this Brexit thing. Uh, <laughs> but, um, I think you know, not, not many people know, actually, that the country where I'm from, Holland, is one of the main tax paradises in the world. You know? we, We've snatched hundreds and hundreds of billions of euros and dollars from American companies, and people don't even know it. There's hardly a conversation around it. Um, so I guess that's where it needs to start, is that we actually start having this conversation. Because is it easy to demolish tax paradises? Yes, it's very easy. Very, very easy. We saw it happening in Switzerland. Yeah. They had this bank secrecy for years and years until the FBI said, stop, don't do that anymore, and it was gone, basically. <laughs> so. Uh, Let's have another final round of, uh, yes, I see a gentleman there, uh, just, just there, yeah. No, no, yeah, just, that's it. Hi, um, thanks for everything tonight. Um, I was just wondering, so you've said that you are, um, kind of represent a movement. What would your advice be to everyone here on how to kind of take your ideas forward and to actually kind of and that's them in the world. Mm -hmm. Can I answer that one immediately? Yeah, go for it, yeah. Okay, so the first thing is, if you're a moderate, stop that. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, <laughs> because you really can't afford to be one right now. If you're young in, in this day and age, the, the challenges that lie ahead of us are so immense. The transformation of the economy that we need is so radical uh, that just tinkering around the edges just won't do it. And it doesn't matter if you see yourself as a left-wing or a right-wing person, it really doesn't matter. Because the timetable for climate change, it's just being set by reality. We need to act and we need to act quickly. Um, that's, that's one and probably the most important thing. The other thing is, if you have a television, throw it out of the window. <laughs> um, because if you keep on That's consuming, not very moderate, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, if you keep on consuming the news and, and, and all this, the, the, the relentless bad news media, you'll be so cynical and so depressed, and you'll believe that n n you know it's never going to change anything, right? And that everything is hopeless, and you can't afford that because we need hope to to actually build and grow this movement. Um, and then the last thing is. Don't be an individual, organize, you know? Join a group, be part of something bigger, because that's exactly uh, what we've seen happening in the past couple of years, right? People are now very enthusiastic about someone like AOC, I mean, I'm a groupie as well, but she's actually the product of a group called the Justice Democrats. Not many people know that, but she wouldn't be there where, where she is right now without her. I'm a product of a journalism platform called The Correspondent, uh, which actually started five years ago and gave me a, a place to work and is supported by 60,000 members. Launching so, in this country in September? I believe, yeah, yeah, in English in September of this yeah. year. So that's really important to remember. History is, is not changed is it, by individuals. It's, uh, it's, we move forward with, by groups, by organizations, so join one of them. I'm going to sneak in two more. There's one over there. Yep. Hi, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask a question about the open borders argument. Um, so I agree with you in general that immigration is generally a good thing and the, the downsides are overplayed. Um, but 
to what extent do you think liberal societies should work to um, sort of eradicate illiberal views in certain immigrant communities? And in what ways should they do that? I'm thinking um, in cases, for example, disagreements in the education system, for, for, for example. So, um, yeah, basically, I, I wanted to, to your, your, your opinions on that and, and what your perspectives are um, in how to deal with um, illiberal immigrants, for example. Okay, and they, uh, just, just here at the, in the third row, if you could just bring them around. Thank you very much. Thanks for waiting. Thank you. Just thinking about another book that's come out quite recently. Um, it's called Winners Take All. Um, the author actually talks about uh, foxes at one point and how uh, there's only one thing that's better than being a fox, and that's being a fox that's responsible for looking after all the hens. Um, and so I'm interested to find out what your perspective is on cross-sector collaboration to address social inequality. Do you think there is a place for private sector and NGO partnerships to address poverty. Okay, so cross-sector collaboration and mm -hmm. the whole question of illiberalism and egalitarianism. Mm -hmm. Small questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, no Just problem. if you could dash them off. <laughs> no. Easy. Um, so I think the, the issue, and Anand, who wrote the book, uh, When It Takes All, um, I, I think he rightly points out that often this, these philanthropy schemes are being used as sort of corporate branding, right? To sort of pretend we're doing something about the world uh, while our actual business model is basically to destroy the world or pollute the world or extract wealth, right? So, yeah, in that case, I'm very skeptical of all these private initiatives. Um, maybe just change your business model first and then start talking about philanthropy. Apart from that, I have nothing against any kind of private initiative or philanthropy. I think that's all wonderful and great. Uh, and lots of different organizations all have a role to play. Uh, but this is, I, mean, I think, one of the reasons why the Davos thing became such a big thing, right? Because people just can't stand the hypocrisy of, 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 of billionaires who are talking about their wonderful philanthropy schemes, while at the same time, at the same time, people know what's going on. The massive tax avoidance, the expo exploitation of workers not paying them a living wage, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, and then there was a question about inequality and illiberalism as well, which was yeah. So there's a very old theory that I've delved into uh, a couple of months ago in, in psychology, which is called contact theory. Now the idea is very simple: is that people tend to be distrustful of, of other people that they haven't met yet, but once you actually meet people, in most cases, they're pretty nice, right? Yep. So. There's a huge body of evidence, actually. A couple of years ago, there was a, what they call a meta-analysis of more than 500 studies. Turns out this is actually one of the most ro robust theories that we have in psychology. It really works. If you bring people together of different ages, of different ethnicities, of different uh, kind of ed educational backgrounds, it works. You know, they actually like each other. So you can build your institutions and your democracies around that. I'm very much in favor of mixing schools of participatory democracy where people actually get around, you know, and, 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 and uh, try and make compromises. I think that's sort of the basic insight that we always need to return to. Make sure that you actually meet people in real life, because in real life, most people are pretty nice. And also, the hostility to immigrants tends to be greatest in areas where there are no immigrants. Exactly, are exactly. Immigrants. Well, that's a lovely note to end on. Um, I think it's been an inspiring evening. Thanks to Rutger. Would you join me in thanking him very much?